let's go to the exercises. The exercise 1.3 was nothing but have a look to the solution of several eigenvalue equations to see the type of spectrum the operators have. Hmm? For instance, uh, let me try to... Marker. Okay, so for instance, um, the linear momentum operator in most uh, quantum chemistry or elementary quantum mechanic, mechanic books, you have the expression in the position coordinate. This will be described in detail later on, but you know that the operator is usually put in this way minus i h bar derivative with respect to x. Eh? And it is clear that any exponential function, when, when we take its de derivative, gives again an exponential function. So the, the, the eigenfunctions are usually put that way. No, x, where k is any real number. So in this case, the spectrum is completely continuous, and in fact, it's the whole real axis. Hmm? What about the z component of the orbital angular momentum? If you look at the, the expression of this operator in polar coordinates, you will found that the expression is very similar to the expression of px. But now, instead of having the derivative with respect to x, we have a derivative with respect to the azimuthal angle uh, phi, yeah? Lz, in uh, position coordinates is minus i h bar derivative with respect to phi. So, in principle, we could take also exponential functions. Well, we take uh, complex exponential functions because the real exponential functions tend to infinity for positive or negative x, and they are not good as wave functions. So, we take this complex with also a constant and the angle. But here we have a restriction due to the geometrical meaning of this coordinate. You know that the coordinate of a complex number, the angular coordinate of a complex number in polar notation. Okay. Um, well, no, I mean, the, the, no, let's, let's, right. In polar coordinates, this is the angle phi. And of course, the angle phi equals zero must be the same as the angle equal to pi. <clears throat> and if we impose to this function that the value for angle zero must be the same as the value <coughs> for angle two pi, we reach the conclusion that m must be integer because only for integer numbers the, the angle here is equivalent to 2 pi. Yeah? For m0, we have this value. For m1, we have one term in the complex plane. For m2 or minus 1 or minus 2, we have an integer number of turns clockwise or anticlockwise in the plane. So the geometrical meaning of the angular coordinates makes the spectrum be discrete instead of the continuous case for 
the linear momentum. Mm -hmm. And so this is a simple example of operator having a completely discrete spectrum. Mm -hmm. All the integer numbers times, uh, well, this, this function, in fact, uh, the eigenvalue in this case is m h bar. And so all the integer multiples of h bar are candidates for eigenstates, for eigenvalues. Well, for a free spinless particle that moves along the x axis, uh, you know that the operator is p square, is the square of this operator divided by 2m. Let's, uh, let's try. Okay. And um, here it's readily verified that uh, operator P, in fact, uh, in fact, uh, you can apply it to a function e plus minus i kx or cosinus kx or sinus kx, etc. There are uh, several functions that give the same eigenvalue h2 k2 divided by 2m times the same function. Yeah. In fact, here we have only two independent functions. For instance, we can take the cosinus and the sinus, or we can take the a to plus and a to minus k i k a, a i k x, and any couple of functions is a basis for a two-dimensional eigenspace with eigenvalue with this eigenvalue. Mm? So you can check that this is true. It's rather trivial in position coordinate representation. And I put in P in terms of the operator Kx, Px. So the spectrum, again, is completely continuous, but positive. And for P, we had the whole real axial was the spectrum. Here, only the positive real axis is a spectrum because k is square. And finally, we have already commented that the Hamiltonian for the internal. Uh, yes, I have a question here. Yes, sorry. Sorry, thank you very much. And finally, for the hydrogen atom, we have already commented that. The spectrum has, has two parts, the negative discrete part and the positive continuous part. Bound states and collision states, unbounded states. Mm -hmm. Well, these are examples of different types of spectrum. Let's again. This we have already, sorry, already discussed it. Let's have a look to this exercise. Um, just interrupt me if you have any question, eh? even those who are, I, I will try to, to be, to pay attention to the messages, or at least my students here will, will, tell, will tell me. Well, um, when non-relativistic effects are included in the Hamiltonian of the poly electronic atom, that is, we consider only Coulombic potential energy, the corresponding energy levels are known as spectral terms. The usual notation for this includes the electron configuration and the eigenvalues of L square and S square. For instance, this is the ground term the least energy spectral term for the carbon atom. 
well, it can be shown mathematically that the operators, the Hamiltonian, and the operators corresponding to L square, LZ, S square, and Z, all of them commute, and so all of them are mutually compatible. The question is, which of the of these operators are functions of the Hamiltonian? What means that an operator is a function of another operator? In some cases, it's very trivial. For instance, we have seen that the kinetic energy is a function of the momentum, because given the expression for the momentum operator, we have a mathematical, analytical expression to obtain the other operator, the kinetic energy operator. But even if we have not an analytical expression, we can have functions. A function, in fact, is nothing but <coughs> to assign to every value of the variable a result, the function of that value. And as we can see, in the previous slide. In fact, all we know to define a function is to define the functions, the, the images of any of all the eigenvalues of the variable. In that way, by giving a list of numbers corresponding to the values f of a for each a, we have defined a function. With this idea, let's go to the exercise. When let's consider the ground state of the carbon atom, for instance. I told you I have a carbon atom in a state having that energy. And I give you the energy in Hartley's, eh, for instance, never mind, eh, minus 7 point tal, 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 a large collection of numbers. Then, with this information, you can take the games, Gaussian, Orca, any quantum chemistry package to take a large basis set to make a configuration interaction calculation or upper cluster, any quite precise calculation for such a simple atom, it's a very easy question. And then you obtain which is, you make calculations for several states, and then you look which is the state having this energy. And this information is not enough to define a single state. Why? Because you know that, for instance, this energy term has a defined energy, but the quantum numbers ML and MS are undefined. Here, the number, P, the letter P means that L equals one, so the quantum number associated to the Z component of L can take the values 1, 0, minus 1. And same for the spin. Number 3 means that the quantum number associated to S square is 1. So the Z component can, can take three values 1, 0, minus 1. So in fact, we have this combination of values that is 9 states, nine vector states with the same energy. If I gave you only the energy, you don't know ML or MS, but you can know which is L square and which is S square, because you can take any eigenfunction of the Hamiltonian without eigenvalue, then you operate with this operator, and this must be an eigenstate of L squared. Because, um, well, because this commute with the Hamiltonian, 
So there must be um, an eigenstate of the, bueno, a, a complete set of eigenstates of the three vectors, the Hamiltonian, this one, and this one. And uh, um, Well, and in fact, let me see. <laughs> My reasoning is, I'm not sure it's perfect. Let me see. Um, I'm sure of the result, but I'm not sure, so sure of how to explain it to you. <laughs> it's clear that for a given term, if you take any of the eigen, ah, yeah, yeah, okay. Okay. If I, yeah, if I change the energy, surely I change the wave function, of course. And uh, for, oh, the reason is not so clear. I, I, I didn't realize of one point. Eh? It's clear that we have a complete set of eigenvalues of these three operators, for instance. But given the eigenvalue for the energy, for the Hamiltonian, I'm sure that we have to have completely determined the eigenvalue of L square and S square. Why? Uh, it could be, for instance, here we have a degeneracy with respect to the energy. Mm. Let me let me think about it. Uh, of course, you should also think about it, <laughs> and we can finish discussing it. I I want I want I don't want to lose time with this. I see very clear the <laughs> the end of the reasoning, but not the middle part. Uh, and the question I want to show you is that given the energy, you have completely completely determined these two observables. So these two observables are in are functions of the energy. But Lz and SZ or not, because given the energy, we have several possibilities, and so these are not functions of the Hamiltonian. And so the conclusion is that in order to have a complete set of compatible observables, for instance, we can have the Hamiltonian LZ and SZ. Um, in some text, it's sometimes also included here S square and L square. Maybe the reason is that normally to specify a term, we do not give the energy. We give the values of this two operators, that means the letter and the multiplicity, because it's much more informative, that information, than the energy. The energy is a number, but for qualitative discussions, to know if this system has, for instance, an, a magnetic moment or not, is much more interesting to know the value of these two observables. Hmm? And, but strictly speaking, hmm, uh, I am almost sure, <laughs> I will confirm you when I think about it, uh, in fact, with the energy and these two, you should have enough. Yeah? So these are redundant in the sense that these commute with these three, but are functions of one of them, so we do not need to include it into the complete set. Even uh, but mm, normally they are included in the notation, but in fact only with this number and the values of 
MLMMS, we could specify a single pure state. You see, uh, okay, think about it. I will also think because there is some point now I don't see very clear, <laughs> and I will discuss you uh, discuss it to you later on. Okay, let's uh, go on. Well, other other yeah here specify three different sets. Of course, we could have chosen say L X or L Y and the same for the spin. Uh, so we have several possible choices. And also we have very different choices. For instance, um, it can be demonstrated. Uh, you have it, uh, the demonstration is in my notes in Spanish, but well, uh, you can find it in any book, for instance, in the Galindo Pascual book, uh, that for a single particle, the operators x, y, z, if we do not consider spin, are a complete set. And also the operators, the observables px, py, and pz form a complete set. And for a system, for an atom having n electrons, the coordinates of all the n electrons are a complete set. So, uh, different complete sets can have different different number of observables. Here we have only three observables. If we change Lz by Lx, again we have three observables. But if we take the coordinates of position or the linear momenta of every electron, then you have 3n, in fact 3n plus n spin coordinate that that's in fact four n coordinates that also are a complete set so the number of elements in a complete set depends on the set we are chosen okay uh, let's uh, let's see Let's go to the following exercise, <clears throat> which deals again with a polyelectronic atom. Here, we are, consider that we, we are considering that we include spin orbit terms in the Hamiltonian. We, we include this term with relativistic correction, then it can be shown that the Hamiltonian commutes with g square and g z, where g is the spin, the total spin plus orbital angular momentum. But it no longer commutes with the orbital only or spin only angular momentum. So, now, for instance, uh, you already know from basic quantum chemistry books that, for instance, you can, you can show that the ground term, in fact, is split in three levels that have different values of j. You have 3, p 0, 3, P1, 3P2. We already discussed this in the last class. Eh? And, um, and then, again, you have some degeneracy, which is uh, the different possible values that Mj can take. For instance, Mj here can have the values 1, 0 minus 1. Here can have the values 2 until minus 2, 5 values, and here only 0. And so now again, the same reasoning tells us that 
given the Hamiltonian and the value of j square, sorry, or, and the value of j z, we can specify a single state. And so the complete set could be, for instance, Hamiltonian j z. We normally also specify j square because it's uh, an interesting information from the physical point of view, and that's why we put it here. We even specify S and L. Why? At least for light atoms, uh, these operators do not commute with Hamiltonian, but they almost commute. And the commutator is rather small. So, uh, it's useful to use these approximate quantum numbers even when the exact expression of the state vector is not an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian and of the orbital or spin-only angular moment. Huh? You know that for heavy atoms, there is a different way of coupling the angular the individual total angular moment of the electrons and we have the gg coupling so depending on the systems this can be considered good approximately good quantum numbers or not but the j is a strictly good quantum number the eigenstates of the hamiltonian can be taken eigenstates all also of j square and j z and this is a function of hamiltonian but j z not j z should be specified in general to obtain to define a single pure state okay and finally if we apply a magnetic field you probably have already seen that the zeeman effects adds a new term to the energy that depends on the quantum of the z component of j and so for instance these three states which were degenerate for the isolated atom becomes non-degenerate we have instead of one energy we have three energies and here we have five energies and so the degeneracy of the of the levels of the energy levels is completely broken and then by giving the Hamiltonian we specify a single state so when we have a magnetic field the Hamiltonian by itself is a complete set of commuting observables so with these examples I hope that you see the, the idea you know, of how to specify such sets. Okay? Well, if you have any question, of course, let me know. And let's continue. Um, okay, so let's go on. Uh, something that you already know, let's connect it with what we are seeing. Um, expected values are nothing but mean values in what we know as expected or mean values in, probably in probability theory. The expected values of a, of a property that is not well defined in probability theory is the sum I, sorry, is the expected value, for instance, of the results of uh, dice yeah, is the sum of the possible results times the corresponding probability. Yeah. So the expected value should be 1 times 1 over C, plus 2 times 1 over C, plus 6 times 1 over C, and this gives 3.5. This is the expected value. That means that you, if you threw the dice many times, the mean value of the result is 
of the results is 3.5. So if we apply this to uh, quantum observable, the expected value for some state psi at some instant of time t is the sum of the possible results when we measure that property. Uh, here, again, is the similar case as in the dice. We make the experiment many times. The only question is that here we have to take many systems, all of them in the same state, and then make the measurement of the property aid in all of them. So to assure that in every case we have the same state. We take the average of the results and then the expected value should be each possible value, that is each eigenvalue, times the probability of obtaining that eigenvalue that, as we have seen in postulate 3, is given by this expression. And uh, yes, question here. Yes, uh, I, am I, I am assuming that wave functions are always normalized because if not, the probability is not given by this expression. Hmm? Yes, uh, in the postulate, if you read the postulate, you should see, I expect, <laughs> that it says that this is a normalized state vector. Yeah? In general, of all of the expressions related to, to probabilities, expected values, and so on, assume that the waveform, well, the state vector is normalized. Okay. Well, if the operator has also a continuous spectrum, then you have to add a similar expression, but with an integral instead of the sum over the eigenvalues in the continuous spectrum and again the probability densities times the differential of the of the property well if you have a look to the expression we found the last day Sorry, I have a small problem with the screen. Okay. So if we have a look to this expression, you can see that if we multiply here by the state vector and here by the state vector, you obtain precisely the expression you obtain exactly this expression. So the expected value can be written as state vector times the result of applying the operator again to the state vector. I normally use this notation, but a more useful notation is by adding a second bar here. Eh? But that's exactly the same. Well. Um, some particular trivial cases. For instance, if the state vector is an eigenstate of the op operator corresponding to the observable we are measuring, then the expected value is the eigenvalue, eh? the corresponding eigenvalue. This is trivial because here we can put the, the result of applying A, that's the eigenvalue times the state vector. This is a constant that can go outside. This should be normalized. And then we have a result that is trivial if we consider the physical meaning of expected values. Um, when we, uh, well, no, in fact, the, the result tell us that when the state of the system is an eigenstate, we obtain the eigenvalue with um, no, sorry, with certainty, but we will see this later on. 
For the moment, yeah, uh, we will see that when we, in this case, yeah, in this case, the probability is really seen to be one for this value and zero for the others. And so, in this case, of course, the average value of many measurements should be the single value that is obtained in all of them. <clears throat> well, um, the probability of obtaining some value when measuring some property in a pure state is expected value can be considered as expected value of a dichotomous observable PA. A dichotomous observable is an observable that can take only two values. And the uh, projector onto the eigenspace corresponding to the eigenvalue a sub i can be considered as the operator of some dichotomous observable. Let's let's think of a machine of a measurement device that gives the result one for any vector in the eigenspace of a with eigenvalue small a small a i and zero for any other vector which is orthogonal to that to that eigenspace eh? to the, uh, any vector in the orthogonal complement of that eigenspace the operator representing this observable is precisely the projector operator and this is dichotomous because this observable can take only values zero or one and so probabilities can be considered as expected values of projection operators uh, let me i don't know why okay sometimes let us disappear here so in fact any stable physical information about a quantum system that can be predicted by quantum theory can be put as an expected value. The only thing that theory predicts are expected values. Expected values can be probabilities, can be expected values of any other observable, or can be eigenvalues in the particular case of eigenstates of what we are measuring, but everything can be put as an expected value. Okay, that will be interesting for the for what we are going to introduce just now. Okay, of course you already know that expected values give a, a very incomplete information about an observable, eh? and usually this information is com is complemented with the uncertainty or indetermination, dispersion, standard deviation. All of them are synonymous of what is already introduced in probability theory as a way of measuring the spread of individual measurements around the expected value. That's the mean of the di squared differences of the values of the property and the mean value of the property. Then we take the expected value of this observable and finally we take the square root so that the result has the same units as the observable A. And uh, as in probability theory, if we, if we expand this square, we readily obtain an alternative expression which is useful for calculated undeterminations. Hmm? Well, uh, it's a trivial question to verify that if the waveform, the state vector is an eigenstate of the operator, then of course all the measurements give the expected value 
which coincides with the eigenvalue, and then all these differences are zero, and this is zero. And the reverse is also true. And so this is a condition, this is equivalent to say that we have that our state is an eigenstate of the operator we have measured. Well, go on. Um, of course, you, as you know, uncertainties in quantum mechanics are not a consequence of inf in imperfection of measurement devices, but at, uh, it's something inherent to the, to the system. Eh? Um, we will discuss this in the, in the last session in, in Madrid. I want to to, devoy, to to dedicate one session to somewhat more philosophical discussions about the interpretation of quantum mechanics. And then I will show you that, in fact, it's clear that the uncertainty is not due to a lack of knowledge in the sense of classical uncertainty. In classical uncertainty, if we do not know the result of, a, of throwing a dice, uh, we always think that this is because we do not know exactly the conditions of the experiment, eh? the detailed conditions. Eh? But in quantum mechanics, even with a maximum degree of information, we cannot predict results. Eh? So it's uh, more fundamental indeterminacy or uncertainty than in classical mechanics. A nice example is the case of a spin three half particle. If you can check for a spin three half particle, you know that S square takes the value uh, three over two multiplied by three over two plus one h bar square, and this is. Uh, I think 14, 15 <laughs> over 4 h bar square. Hmm? Okay. And um, on the other hand, you know that if you measure as z, you can obtain the values plus minus one half or plus minus one over or in. Uh, 3 over 2. Mm -hmm. And the same if we measure as x or if we measure as y. Mm -hmm. uh, you probably think, okay, since these three observables are incompatible, I cannot have a state in which the three are determinates. Hmm? But that means that we are not able to measure them or that, in fact, they have not any value. Well, if let's assume that each component has a single value, which is one of these two four values but we do not know which. For instance, it could be that as x, x, say, takes a value plus one half, and this also plus one half, this also plus one half. What should be then the square of the modulus? It should be the sum of the three squares is three over four. And this is not possible. If we measure S square, we always obtain this value. Because for this type of particle is the only value, this is an intrinsic value that 
uh, is a property so intrinsic as the mass of the charge of the particle. We could also have, for instance, 1 over 2 here, 3 over 2, and say 1 over 2. And then the square of the modulus should be uh, 9, 11 over 4. And this is not the result we obtain. And we can check that any combination of these four values for s, x, y, or z, none of them gives the result we must obtain for s squared. So the conclusion is that it's not a lack of knowledge of the value taken by these three properties. In fact, we can have states in which we know s square and we know, say, s z. But then these two properties, in a certain sense, have no existence. They, are, they have no value between the allowed values that we can check experimentally. So it's rather strange. When a property in quantum mechanics is undeterminate, in fact, in a certain sense, is not defined. It's not a lack of knowledge about the value it has. It has not a value. Well, that's a question of uh, philosophical, that's a question of interpretation. We will go back to this at the end of my classes. Let's go to the more concrete questions. Um, what happens here? OK. I have a, an exercise here, which is related to this theorem. You already know that for two observables, there is, there is a relationship between the uncertainties of the two, which depends on the commutator of the corresponding observables. Think about this exercise. Can there be states with, yeah? here I should add, um, we are lizable states. That means state, physical states, states that can be really prepared in a laboratory. Yeah? In quantum mechanics, we sometimes use ideal states that are impossible to obtain. For instance, in principle, if I can prepare a particle, a single a spinless particle in a state with wave function a to a k x, for this state, I could assert that the px x component of the linear momentum takes the value h k. So we have an eigenstate of the uh, linear momentum. But this is a limit case, a hypothetical case, which is never found in reality, in physics, because it's impossible to measure a continuous property with complete accuracy with zero undeterminacy. So in physical realizable states, we can never have delta p equals zero. Mm -hmm. So, and this can be readily seen from this relationship. So the exercise is to apply this relationship to discuss the points that are considered here. Think about it and we will discuss it next day, OK? Well, uh, let's go on. Density operator. We are now reaching an interesting point in which we will see how to deal with systems for which we cannot specify a single state vector, so we cannot say which is the pure state of the system. Let's consider a system that has probabilities p1, p2, 
Pn of being in the pure states psi 1, psi 2, psi n. And let's calculate the expected value of some property A in that situation, in that physical situation. Of course, if I know the probabilities for a set of pure states, and I know which should be the expected values for every pure state, in fact, the expected value in my real problem should be an average of averages, and that's what I have put here. Let me see. Okay. It's a sum of the expected values for each pure state times the weight, the probability of that state, and we sum over the collection of pure states that define my incompletely determined state, my mixed state. And this, when we have such an incomplete information, we say our system is in a statistical mixture of pure states, bravely mixed state. Okay? Well, let's, let's here introduce a resolution of the identity in any denumerable orthonormal basis set. That means I choose any basis set in the Hilbert space, and what is here in red is the identity operator. So I insert the identity operator here. Then, <clears throat> um, then I invert the order of, the, of this term and this term, and I obtain, there's a problem, Our letters disappear sometimes. Uh, then I obtain this, and here, what is in blue is defined as the density operator or the statistical operator corresponding to my physical state. That is, a sum of a, a collection of probabilities uh, yeah, a sum of probabilities times this is the projection operator over the pure state psi A. And if I introduce this definition, then I can write my result in that way. Yeah? This is the new operator I have introduced that when multiply at the left hand side by A and by J and sum over J, then we obtain just what we have before. So, this knowledge, the knowledge of this operator allows to calculate any expected value for our mixed state. And we have said before, we have said before that all the information we can predict about the physical system can be put as an expected value. So this is all the information we need for calculating expected values for mixed states. This, in a certain way, is the generalization of the state vector for mixed states. Okay? Um, well, let's make the break here, and now we will discuss deeply the properties of this operator, this statistical or density operator. Okay? If you have any question, not? Okay, so let's pause recording. Let's go on. So we have seen that we have a way of mm, specifying mathematically 
a mixed state. If we have information about probabilities of several pure states, the sum, the operator defined as the sum of the projectors over those pure states multiplied by the corresponding probabilities, it's an operator that allows to obtain the expected value of any physical state, of any physical property. Let's have a look to the to the properties of this operator. Uh, first, this operation we have here is called trace of operator D. In fact, as we will next see in for coming days, this is nothing but the trace of the matrix that represents the operator on the chosen basis set. Yeah? Well, but for, for now, uh, for the moment, this is a definition of the trace of the operator. Yeah? And we can choose any denumerable orthonormal basis set to calculate this trace. Yeah? It's really seen that this is independent on the chosen basis set. We will show it in a forthcoming exercise. Well, the trace of an Hermitian operator can be shown to be the sum of its eigenvalues. The idea is simple. We can choose as the basis set, the basis set of eigenstates of the operator, yeah? the Hermitian since the density operator is an Hermitian operator, um, well, uh, I have not uh, say why, but it's it's really seen that the density operator is an Hermitian operator. You can check the Hermeticity definition and apply the definition to the operator, and you would find that it's an Hermitian operator. And for any Hermitian operator, the trace is the sum of the eigenvalues, which is seen by choosing the eigenstates basis sets. Basis set. uh, the trace is invariant on the cyclic permutations of a given product of operators. And we can take, for instance, the last one, put it here. And well, you can make this anytime so, uh, as you like, and it's really seen that it is invariant. And um, well, the trace of the of the density operator is one. It's also rather easy to verify it, and in fact, this is related to the physical significance of the probabilities. Eh? This is related to the fact that the sum of the probabilities defining the mixed state must be one. And finally, if you calculate the trace of this particular uh, state, that means, in fact, this is the density operator of a pure state. Because if we go back to the definition, if we have probability, if we have probability one for some given state, say psi one, and zero for all the others, then our state is in fact pure, is psi one, and so pure states can be also identified with a. Make a statistical operator, which is the projector over the corresponding gap. For this case, this way of calculating eh, the expected value, eh, in fact, eh, by using the definition of the trace, the result we have obtained in the previous slide can be written that way expected value of any observable in a state k 
characterized by some given density operator is the trace of A of A times rho. And uh, in the particular case of a pure state, it's really seen that this way of calculating expected values is equivalent to the usual expression we have obtained with using the ket representing the state. This is also, this is trivially demonstrated. You only have to take any basis set that contains this, and this uh, that contains psi. Eh? And the demonstration is trivial. Huh? Well, <clears throat> let's look at some examples. Let's consider that you, we have a beam of hydrogen atoms that emerge from an isotropic chamber. Of course, we neglect the adjacent effects. And we have it at a low temperature. So we can be sure that all of them are in the ground state. But we are interested in including the spin in our description. And so since we have an isotropic chamber, we have no idea of the spin. We have the same probability, for instance, if we measure SZ, we should have equal probabilities of obtaining positive and negative values. What should be the vector, the density operator describing such a situation? We have probability of obtaining spin uh, Z co positive component and probability of obtaining negative component. Since the spatial part of the state is always the 1s, because we know it's in the ground state, the density operator describing those atoms is a sum of two projectiles. Okay? Uh, this I have already commented. Eh? If the state is pure, the density operator then is a projector onto a unidimensional space. And so pure states can be described either as projectors, as density operator, or as state vectors, or strictly speaking, unitary rays, because here I have an um, undeterminate phase. Mm -hmm. The density formalism in this sense is nicer because there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between pure states and mathematical objects. Here we have several mathematical objects, several gets that represent the same pure state. Here we have a single projector because if we include an arbitrary phase here, the phase goes out here and goes out here, in this case with a complex conjugate, and so the two phases vanish. And so here it's we have a, a, a univoc way of assigning a mathematical tool to represent the state. <clears throat> One. Let's have a look to this exercise. Show that the state vector, this is a state vector, one s here, I cannot distinct, ah yeah, one s plus minus And the state vector is defined as this linear combination of the 1s alpha and 1s beta hmm? uh, of a hydrogen atom. Show that these two states, the, the states corresponding that of, uh, to these two uh, vectors, are um, represent a state in which we have perfectly no Z with components or Sx with components plus or minus one half. These are eigenstates of Sx. This is a trivial question. If you put 
the operator, this should be operator, uh, in terms of the ladder operator, this is very straightforward to demonstrate. Okay. Mm, have a look, try to, to check it for next day, and we will discuss it here. Okay. Second part, write the density operator describing the atoms emerging from an isotopic chamber in terms of S plus and 1s plus and 1s minus in terms of these two eigenvectors and show that it is the same that we have written in the previous slide in terms of eigenstates of Sz. Here this is a pure state which is an eigenstate of Sz. Here we have eigenstates of Sx. The question is, we normally describe the spin of an electron in terms of eigenstate, or oh, sorry, this is Z, in terms of Sz, eh? alpha or beta. But if the system is in isotropic conditions, there is nothing special with the Z direction. We could also consider that uh, the atoms have are uh, have um, fifty percent of probabilities of having S X positive or negative value. And if we take this point of view, then the density operator should be written in a different way. Should be written, well, I give part of the solution, but let's put it. Eh? So I, I would say, okay, the density operator should be one over two projector over S one S plus plus one over two projector over one S minus. And in fact, the system is the same. Which one to choose? Well, in this exercise, we will verify that those two operators are exactly the same. That if we expand, if we put here, substitute this, this, and the same here, we obtain that at the end, we are led to the same density operator. Um, by the way, uh, you will find operators in which you have uh, something like this. Here I have I and J. And so this is not a projection operator, but it acts exactly the same way. When applied to a ket, you have to take the scalar product and then multiply by this ket. Eh? So this, uh, when you take the density operator and express it in an arbitrary basis set, you can found that in the expression, you obtain cross terms that are not projectors. Eh? These terms are called coherences. And uh, well, the physical meaning, I will not enter into details, but I have a paper in which it's uh, deeply discussed this, the physical meaning of coherences, which is rather subtle. Huh? Well, here the coherences will disappear, and at the end you obtain this expression. The, from the physical point of view, this is rather rather interesting because that means, for instance, let's consider. Let's try to take a white sheet. Let us see. Uh, well, uh,
Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's assume that you have a stepper like device. You know, it's a device to measure and separate states alpha from states beta. Eh? The hydrogen atoms go out from a chamber and they go through a stepper like device in which this is oriented along the z-axis, and then you have alpha states and beta states. I know here that every atom is in, is in an eigenstate of Sz. I can check for each of them, which is if it goes through the upper side, uh, uh, it goes through the upper path or, or the lower path. And then I take all those atoms, the two beams, and I mix them. I make them go into a new box. Which is, if I take an atom from this box, which should be its state? The state of this atom has 50% of probability of being alpha and 50% of being beta. So I should describe it by the density operator, which is one half, let's simplify it, alpha alpha plus one half beta beta. But then I make a different experiment. Very similar, but now the a standard lag experiment is oriented along the x-axis, and then the atoms are separate according to the positive or negative value for this x component. And then again, I make both beams go to a chamber in which I am sure that every atom has a well-defined x component which can be positive or negative. And so the way of describing this physical situation, which is different than the previous one, because here, here I know Sx for every atom, and here I know Sz for every atom. But then the state vector, the density operator, sorry, could be written this way. And as you will see in the exercise, these two things are mathematically equivalent, the same. And so that means that there is no way of differentiating this situation from this situation. Even if we know, because we have preparating the system, the final system, the atoms in the final box, we have prepared it in different ways. Here I have information about some component, here I have information about the other component, but there is no way of distinguishing between them. And um, in quantum mechanics, it could happen. In classical mechanics, this could not happen because um, in classical mechanics, we the properties are assumed to be always well defined. And we always should be able to measure them and to see the difference between these two boxes. In quantum mechanics, even if I know that there should be a difference, there is no way of verifying this. And that's interesting because the multiplicity of ways of writing the density operator from some physical system, for instance, allows us to choose uh, the most simple way of describing the system. For instance, in statistical mechanics, you, are, you normally use the Boltzmann law, and you are told, OK, half of the atoms, or if, for instance, if you have an NMR experiment, then the hydrogen 
the protons could be also in the state alpha or beta. And at some temperature, the Boltzmann law allows to know if the atoms are in alpha or are in beta. But why alpha and beta? Why not? Uh, there could be atoms that are in any other direction with a spin point, pointing not to the z axis but to the x or to or with any other angle so there are many possibilities of building the density operator for this physical situation but the simplest way is to take this one and it can be shown that if you take um, other expressions for the density operator that maybe are more complex you will reach the same final result. I will show you in the next slide, um, in, in the paper I have commented you before, you even can take, in fact, the most realistic way of defining, for instance, the density operator of, uh, of an elect of a hydrogen atom that goes out from the isotropic chamber here. Before making any measurement, we we use a density operator that can be represented. In fact, this is the same operator that defines, that specifies the state of the atoms going out from the chamber. But a more realistic density operator should take into account that any direction in the space is equally possible. And so we should take a mixture not of only alpha or beta or plus or minus, a mixture with equal probabilities for the spin states pointing to any direction in the continuous sphere or possible directions. If you make this calculation, in, in that case, you have not a sum of two terms, but a, an integral over the whole set of possible orientations of the spin, and then, and again, you reach this value. That's why, in statistical mechanics, you make the artificial hypothesis of saying, okay, half of the atoms have spin pointing to the positive z direction, half of the atom have the spin with negative z direction. This is completely arbitrary choice because there is nothing special about the z direction, but is equivalent to a more consistent, physically consistent election that mathematically would be more complicated and at the end leads to the same result. Well, I will back to this in the next slide, so let's continue. Ah, okay. <laughs> um, well, let me see. Let me, okay. I have a little problem with the pointer. No sé si es la que viene, o me deja una entre medio. Ok, let's continue. Um, this exercise indicates how could we prepare a hydrogen atom as a measurement. Well, this is trivial according to the discussion. Well, yeah, yeah, the, the exercise has an interesting point. Um, well, How could we prepare a hydrogen atom that emerged from an high isotropic chamber in the pure state corresponding to this state vector? Well, 
uh, the result is evident because we have already seen that this is an eigenstate of Sx. So we should measure Sx and select positive or negative value depending on whether we are interested in the state 1s plus or 1s minus. Which values could we obtain and with what probabilities when measuring Sz in that state? Well, you have to take the third postulate. Here we have two eigenvalues, plus and minus, and you will readily find that for these two states, the probabilities of obtaining positive or negative values for Sz are 1 over 2, 50%. Which experiments should we perform to differentiate that pure state from the mixed state I have put here? If I measure Sz, there is no way of differentiating these two states. So think about it. What should we measure? to prepare this or to prepare, uh, no, to verify that you have this state and to verify that you have this state, okay? Well, um, by the way, uh, this is the only way of describing a non-polarized spin states. In quantum optics, this is very important because normally uh, most of the source of light produce non-polarized photons. And non-polarized photons cannot be described as pure states. You always need the density operator formalism to, to represent this physical situation. The density formalism, the density operator formalism, in fact, is, is more general because it, with the same formalism, you can describe pure and mixed states. And uh, that's why it's so interesting. And you, you do not have to use different tools for these two situations. And in some cases, of course, is the only way of describing the physical system. Well, and finally, well, this is an exercise. Well, this is rather straightforward to, to see that the probability of obtaining some value when, measure, when measuring some property can be written that way. Well, this, in fact, is a direct consequence of the, of the fact that probabilities can be considered as expected values of a dichotomous observable whose operator is the projection operator. And then by using, I think the slides have changed. I think this is 49, because I have added the solution of the exercise also. And this also should be probably 41. And so with those results, this is a rather trivial result. You know, different ways of expressing the probability of obtaining a value when measuring some of it. Observable. Okay. Well, let's go on. Well, this is a discussion I have already partially discussed. Um, in a mixed state, there are two sources in general. There can be two sources of uncertainty: a quantum uncertainty and a classical type uncertainty. For instance, again, we go to the example of a chamber with hydrogen atoms in isotropic conditions. Yeah? The atoms, um, no, sorry, sorry, <laughs> no, it's another case. Here, I have hydrogen atoms in an eigenstate of Sx. And we know that here we have probabilities one half of obtaining the two possible values that can take as z. You have, we have seen it in one of the previous exercises. I have just commented. 
And also here, this is another state in which, as we have seen in that exercise, we again have 50% of probability of obtaining alpha, that means positive value for Rz, and 50% probability of obtaining negative value for Sz. But here, the origin of the uncertainty is typically quantum. Sz, this is a pure state in which Sz is, has a quantum uncertainty. We cannot assign a Z component to the spin of particles that are described by this state vector. Here, the situation is different. If we have built the state by first separating alpha and beta, measuring alpha and beta, measuring the Z components of all the atoms and then mix them in a box, in that physical situation, we know that every atom has a well-defined Z component. So the type of uncertainty is a lack of information. It's a classical type uncertainty. So mixed states can have quantum uncertainty, but also have classical type uncertainty. In fact, mixed states also exist in classical statistical thermodynamics. And the origin of that uncertainty is, of course, classical. So in general, in quantum mechanics, we can have two different types of uncertainty. Um, in fact, uh, for instance, for this mixed state, there are many possible pure states that, when mixed, give the same density operator. We have already seen that by mixing one as alpha and one as, well, uh, of course, by, by mixing one as alpha and one as beta, we obtain this mixture. But also, we could uh, mix states in which alpha and beta are not defined. We have seen that we can mathematically put the density operators in terms of one as plus and one as minus. And in this case, we have both types of uncertainty. Here, I have only classical type uncertainty about Sz. Here, if I have prepared my system by mixing atoms in one as plus and one as minus, then I have the classical type of uncertainty because if I take at random one atom, it could be in this state or in this state, plus a quantum type uncertainty because in both of them, as Z is not determinate because we have a linear combination of two as Z eigenvalues, eigenstates with different eigenvalues. Linear combination, theorem one, I think, is no longer an eigenstate of Sz. Okay? Um, well, here I have just comment on this point. Yeah? In fact, it can be shown that the density operator for a mixed state, for this mixed state, can be put as a uniform mixture of every possible spin state. Uh, well, uh, here it appears <laughs> that in this situation we have more uncertainty than in, in the former, which are in fact mathematically the same operators, so should be physically also equivalent. But here we have only classical type uncertainty. And if I put the density operator of a mi as a mixture of this, and this, then I also have a quantum type uncertainty about Sz. Of course, that's true. Here, I have two sources of uncertainty related to Sz. But 
here surely there are other properties that are less uncertain well well at the end uh, well here in those states of course i know as x while here in one of these pure state i did i do not know as x eh? so at the end the degree of information given a, a particular uh, density operator, the degree of information is univocally defined. Eh? can be quantified by the Shannon entropy, and I won't enter this question. Eh? Well, let's go on. Fourth postulate. Now I will consider the most general case of a system which is in a mixed state so it is defined by some density operator that in principle in general it can be it can change with time so i assume that a certain moment t i make a measurement of uh, property a and to make things very general i consider uh, measurements in quantum mechanics can be accurate enough to give a single value but in most of the cases this is not true for instance if we measure a continuous property we always obtain values within some small interval and it could be that we measure a property if we draw here the values of the property it could be that we have some continuous part of the spectrum and some discrete part of the spectrum and maybe our measurement device have some uncertainty so that we only can specify that the result is within this interval it is most general uh, situation physical situation in which the result of the measurement uh, gives um, has some, some uncertainty that includes a continuous part and a discrete part well in this case what happens to the system if the measurement is ideal a measurement is ideal when it makes the least possible perturbation of the system being measured then the density operator changes to this new density operator which is nothing but projecting the original density operator onto the projector onto the sum the direct sum of the subspaces considered to the eigenvalues included in this interval delta a that means projecting over this the, the subspace with this angle value plus the cyberspace with this angle value plus all the subspaces corresponding to this continuous part for the here in fact i have the definition of the projector the projector over some interval is the sum of the projector over the discrete eigenvalues included in delta and the integral over the continuous values included in delta the denominator is nothing but a normalization constant uh, because well, this has to guarantee that the resulting operator is normalized and this is Let's go to the next slide. Uh, no. No, 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 no problem. Um, this means this is the mathematical way of expressing the projection of an operator. That means that when we apply this operator to some state vector, we have to first project onto the eigenspace corresponding to delta then applied the density operator 
and the result again is projected. Eh? So, in, in this is uh, sometimes called the restriction, the operator restricted to some subspace of the Hilbert space because this operator acts only on projected vectors and the result is again projected. Well, this is the way of defining the projection of an operator onto some subspace, which is here the sum of the subspaces corresponding to the eigenvalues included in delta. Well, particular cases. What happens if the original state is pure? Well, if the original state is pure, the density operator is the projector onto the corresponding uh, state vector. And then we project it, we apply P, the projector, on the right and left hand side. And uh, as we already shown the day before, this operator can be written, sorry, can be put it inside the bra by adding the dagger, by taking the conjugate. And so we have that, and this operator, of course, can also be put inside the cat. In this case, we do not need the, the dagger. But the dagger, in fact, since the operator this uh, for an Hermitian operator, the adjoint coincides with the operator, so we can forget about the dagger, and then we obtain this result. Okay? And on the other hand, we have also seen in a previous slide that this is the square of the projected. The norm, the square of the norm of the projected vector. And so one of these terms can be put inside this cat, and the other one inside this cat. And so we are led to this result that is probably more known by most of you that the original operator is in fact projected by the measurement. Eh? So the pure state is transformed into a pure state, which is the normalized projection of the original state onto the subspace corresponding to the eigenvalue we have obtained, or to the collection of eigenvalues we have obtained. Um, let's consider a simple case of a three-dimensional Hilbert space. As, the, as in the previous class, we assume that we have a system in a pure state and that we are measuring some property A that has two eigenvalues, A1 and A2. The first one is a doubly degenerate eigenvalue, so there are there are two eigenvectors with that eigenvalue that are represented as the basis of the horizontal plane. And the second eigenvalue has um, an eigenvector, which is here drawn in the vertical axis. What happens if we measure A and obtain A1? Then the state vector is projected onto the plane, and the resulting state vector is this one, the normalized projection. Well, the projection would be this vector, then we normalize it, and we obtain this vector. What happens if we, in the measurement, we obtain the second eigenvalue? Then the original vector is projected onto the vertical axis, and we are led to this state, to the state corresponding to this vector. In both cases, 
A becomes well defined after the measurement okay? because here it's within an eigen plane and here within an eigen axis. So in both cases, the result, the change of the state is such that we end with a state in which we have perfectly defined the measured property. In this sense, the physical significance of this postulate is rather trivial. It says that measurements are reproducible. If we obtain some result and we repeat the same measurement in the second repetition, in the second measurement, we are certain that we will obtain the same result always that we had obtained in the first one <laughs> because of this projection. And uh, of course, it is clear that if the vector was originally an eigenvector of what we are measuring, then there is no change mm, introduced by the measurement. If my vector, my original state vector was this one, for instance, I am certain that the result must be A1 and the projection, since it's already in that eigenspace, the projection makes nothing. So in general, measurements change the state of the system. The exception is when the state was already an eigenstate of what we are measuring. <clears throat> well, what happens when the when the state, the original state, is not pure but mixed state? Well, we recall the expression in the postulate: hmm? the resultant density operator it's a projection, and uh, it's really seen. We will see here that again the effect of the measurement is to change the original density operator to a new one, in fact, to the closest possible new one in which the measured properties is defined within the limits, of course, of the uncertainty of the first measurement. That means in, the, in a second measurement, we are certain that we will obtain a value in this interval, with certainty one. Well, here I have the, uh, the verification of this point. Yeah? If we, well, to, <clears throat> if we make a second measurement, since the first, sorry, the first measurement, I, the first measurement change this operator by this operator with the normalization constant here. Then let's apply the same type of measurement. So we again have to multiply on the left hand side and on the right hand side by the same projection operators. But since projection operators are idempotent, here we have the square, which is the same as P, and here we have the square of P, which again is the same. So the numerator has not changed by the second measurement, and so the final density operator is the same. Well, you can verify that the denominator is nothing but a normalization constant. Eh? But it's very easy to, to see. Eh? The trace of the numerator, the trace of the numerator, since traces are invariant under cyclic permutation of the operators, we can put this operator here. And then we have P square which is the same as P. So the term in the denominator is the trace of the term in the numerator. See, if you take the trace of this, you will find the same thing. But well, this is a number. Eh? 
and then you have the trace of the numerator divided by the same number, which is one. Well, so let's stop here. It's just five o'clock. Do you have any question? And if not, uh, think about the exercises. I have comment, and we will discuss them next time. Okay, no questions? Okay, so thank you very much.